Hello and welcome back to the bike lane. I'm Matt Keenan, and as always, joined by the Olympic Games gold medalist Scott McGorry and Mr. Cycling Tips himself, Wade Wallace. Another big show in store. Certainly, Matt. Uh, looking forward to hearing from Chloe McConville. She survived the crazy AIS Women Boot Camp. Boot Camp. And we've got one of the characters of the sport, Mitch Docker, answering your questions. He's a ripper, Mitch Docker. We've also got the healthy living tips, of course, where Scott gets us a few tips on nutrition this week. The hot lap, it's Chris Kavanagh who was up, courtesy of My Kitchen Rules. He's trying to get the better of his cousin Sam, who we saw on the show last week. Plus, for a first, we're out to the Avanti Plus bike kit with Mark O'Brien, one of the new recruits for the Genesis team. But also this week, we've seen the release of the course for the Jayco Herald Sun Tour and the National Championships. Let's start with the Herald Sun Tour because you manage the guy who won it this year. Some interesting changes, prologue in Melbourne, but it finishes at Arthur Seat again. 2.5 kilometre prologue, so it doesn't sound like much, but they're going over the Yarra River on the walking bridge. Yeah. So it, you've got to be very careful there. They might have to have a few divers in the river. We might lose some riders Don't you have early. to walk your bike over that? There's yeah. a sign. Yeah. And if you go over 10 <laughs> kilometres per hour, you'll get a fine. But this is what cycling has been crying for for so long. Bring it to the people. Yeah, absolutely. Look, and then stage one, Geelong out to Ballarat. There's a sneaky little hill halfway along that no one knows about just yet. They'll have to look out for that. Then they go to my town, Bendigo and they have Matt Alexander, so that's a challenging stage. It'll be a bit of a sorting out. And then Mitchell so you get the Scott Winery. McGorry hot lap trophy for winning into Bendigo? It finishes at the, <laughs> it actually finishes, oh, I'm glad you brought it up, finishes at the same spot where I won my stage into Bendigo last decade. Oh yeah, your last, last century, century actually. Yeah, last century. The final stage up Arthur's seat, it works. It's been there the last couple of times and you've had a party on the hill. Yeah, Arthur's seat, it makes for a great race, doesn't it? And it yeah. sort of finishes at twilight. When it was in uh, before Christmas, the weather was kind of sort of unpredictable, but now it'll be a beautiful, beautiful night and get nice sunsets and possibly fireworks, who knows? Yeah, and Garmin Sharp, they're going to have a pretty strong team. Former winner, Nathan Huss, will be leading the charge, along with Steele Van Hoff, and let's see who they bring out. And the course for the national championships. Change to the time trial, not much of an effect. The criterium is where it's always been. The road race, though, it's back on the small circuit, and they've made it longer, 18 laps, 180 plus kilometres for the elite men's road race. Sprinters will be happy, Mark Renshaw will be delighted. Oh, absolutely not. Yeah, it's going to be the hardest race we've seen around Bunningong ever. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of debate about, uh, I guess, if it's too dominated by Orica Green Edge with the numbers. But the heart of the course, I think the, uh, the fair of the race is for everyone. Well, we had one question, courtesy of what's on your mind, and it was, how do we make the Nationals as fair as possible, given the numbers of Orica Green Edge? And, maybe make it just so hard that the numbers are irrelevant. Yeah, it's, everyone asks this and, and you know, you look at Rabobank for so many years, they struggled to win very many national championships, right? So, and they were dominant in the Netherlands and it, you know, it doesn't prove that Orca Green Edge is just going to have this run at all at national championships from here on in. Well, if you look at the uh, pressure. two pressure. years ago when, when Simon Gerrans won it, first time for Orica Green Edge, so it was a great result for the team. But second, third, and fourth weren't Orica Green yeah. Edge. He no, had no, to come up with a So with not a complete domination. Big right. national championships coming up, likewise with the Herald Sun Tour. But first, it's your interview with Mitch Docker. Mitch Docker, any questions? First one from Baden Cook. Is it tough getting mistaken for Patrick Swayze all the time? Well, he's the only one who calls me that, so no, not really. <laughs> but I'd take it. Has joining Orica Green Edge been a good move for your career? Has been um, and will be continually. Why do you collect LPs and what's your favourite album? Why wouldn't I? Sound is awesome and I can't go past Simple Minds album, um, New Gold Dream, 81, 82, 83, 84, awesome album. Please explain your obsession with dressing like a kid from the 80s, Young Talent Time. Um, not really that familiar with Young Talent Time, but just, it just looks cool, you know, like, that's it. <laughs> Any chance of targeting Flanders or a big spring classic? Not Flanders, but Roubaix. Love that race. We'll always love it. Do you have any solution for the crying shame that is your rugby team, the Parramatta Eels? Now they've won the wooden spoon two years in a row. Thank God I haven't been around for it the last two years because it's, it's cringeworthy, but mighty Eels, they'll be back. Do you use anything you learn as a kid at the Brunswick Cycling Junior Clinic in the Pro Peloton? Well, ride from the front, always. Who's a better comedian, you or your Kentucky Tour father, Warren? Uh, who's funnier? 
Well, I think, I hope people, more people laugh with me rather than at me. <laughs> so they laugh at your dad? Maybe. <laughs> Amateur punters in pro cycling kit, is it acceptable or unacceptable? It's acceptable because, uh, yeah, well, who am I going to sell my kit to? <laughs> What's the hardest part of your training? Getting up on rainy days and uh, still having to bloody do it. How do you keep fit in the off season? Uh, cracking a big wave, body surfing. Who has the worst fashion sense, you or your TV star brother Kirk? Worst or best? I don't know. I think uh, I think we both look pretty pretty snazzy. As Bob Hawke supported Hawthorne, do you support the Fremantle Dockers? Well, I do. They're my second team. Closely fought. Well. Closely following Carlton, they're my number one. If you were cycling at the speed of light and you turned your bike lights on, would they do anything? Uh, not probably, I don't know. <laughs> this one's from Kelly Brown. Single? Engaged. <laughs> Sorry, Kelly. What do you like to do off the bike? Uh, wall ball. WBI, World Championship wall ball. Does the Peloton really believe Chris Froome is clean? I think so, yeah. He's, uh, as far as I hear. What's best for batter, beer or fizzy water? Pretty easy, beer. SOM loop or Vuelta, which is harder? This is from Greg Henderson. That's Explain. The, that's the SOM loop. That's a pretty solid loop. Got to be in the middle of summer, boiling hot, out to Hillsville and back. And I would have to say, yeah, Vuelta's just got over the SOM loop the last few years. Have you achieved your New Year's resolution of reading one book per month? I haven't actually, I'm, I'm up to nine. There's, I can have a late rush. Um, yeah, I've got to get reading. Two months left, one month left. What's the best book you've read this year? I was thinking about that. Um, probably funniest book was Catcher in the Rye, but book I took the most out of was Andre Agassi's um, autobiography, Open. Open. And are you the secret pro? <laughs> I, I, no, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> Mitch Docker, thanks for answering our questions. No worries. And Mitch Docker, he is one of the characters of the sport, but he's been sixth at Ghent Wavelgum, 15th at Paris Roubaix, and he's won a couple of pro bike rides, races. You've worked with him in the past. He's good. Oh, he's a good guy, too. You like to work with Mitch. He's got a really good vibe about him. And uh, look, if he wasn't a professional cyclist, maybe he'd be semi pro at least at Wallball, which I, isn't that just handball? Yeah, it Better is. Google, basically. Google Wallball. Yeah, it's, Wallball is handball from the schoolyard. He was one of our first interviews. Yeah, he was. I showed up there and I had trouble even picking them out who they were. They were all, you know, hipsters and <laughs> he fit right in. It was great. He's a good guy. So let's head out to the inside line, courtesy of Avani Plus, and join Mark O'Brien and get fitted for a bike. Getting the right position on the bike is all important. Mark O'Brien here, former medalist at the Australian Championships in the road race in the under 23s maybe 2014 in the elites as well. He's going from the rally team in the UK to the Genesis squad here in Australia in 2014. New bike, new position, he has to get it right. And it's Ryan Kimberley who's got the job of putting him in the right position, courtesy of Avanti Plus. Let's get into it. Mark, how have you done fitting a bike in the past? Uh, a few times before, but uh, mainly it's just been with uh, Jason Nichols and it's just been done by, oh, this is the first time I've dealt with all the, the fancy computers and whatnot. So it's art versus science. What are you hoping to get out of it? Bulk power. <laughs> no, I'm just hoping to get a, a position that's the mix between comfort and power. What do you normally look for in terms of your position? What are the key elements in terms of making sure you're comfortable and maximising your power? Um, I'm very particular with all the little things. Um, I've had a lot of issues in the past with knee issues and uh, I've currently had a bit of a hip issue. So for me, I'm just trying to get that position where I feel really strong, but I'm not getting any of those niggles but you also need to be looking for something where you're able to get the maximum power out. So Ryan, what are the key things you look to pick up to make sure you get Mark in the best position possible? Uh, we want to make sure he's in an efficient, uh, a comfortable and also an injury free position. Um, just to make sure in those long races he's, he's not going to suffer any niggles in his, in his legs or in his hips or in his knees. Um, and also the main thing I suppose for Mark is that he gets the most amount of power out of the bike uh, at the most efficient um, heart rate and, and just make sure everything's all one, one whole. How, how much consideration do you give to injuries he might have had in the past or an elite cyclist like Mark versus C grade, D grade club cyclist? 
Yeah, look, I, I suppose the difference is going to be that Mark's probably had more experience on the bike, more time on the bike. He's going to know what what feels right and, and what doesn't feel right. Um, he's going to have had a lot more niggles in the past and had a lot of changes to his fit to fix those niggles. Um, however, your C-grade cyclist, we still give as much focus on those things as what we do with an elite cyclist like Mark. So Mark, how do you feel on the bike at the moment? Uh, it's quite good actually. Especially, it's always different when you uh, change across bikes. There's always going to be difference with the geometry, but um, at the moment I'm quite fascinated by Ryan's screen, so trying to figure out what is the, the best degrees and what's going to give me the best performance. What's the answer to that, Ryan? Uh, look, somewhere around that 143 degree is a good starting point for us. Obviously, as we put his saddle up, uh, the saddle's also shifting back, so there's a few little minor changes and we're just going to play around with those heights and angles uh, as we go, so it takes a little bit of time to get it to that perfect spot. How far away is he from that? Uh, he's at about 136 at the moment, so we need to come up. Uh, you know, the system will tell us roughly how far we need to come up. About a centimetre and a half, so we'd start by moving him up a centimetre and a half and then take it from there. So, Marco, how's it feel? Excellent, in fact. Yeah, I'm really happy with it. Now, the pressure's on now for the Nationals. Can you go top ten? <laughs> I really hope so. I've, uh, I've had one top ten, so I hope I can go top five this year if all goes to plan. Well, Mark O'Brien is a guy whose career has been close but not quite. Maybe the new team will let him take the next step up. But Scott Wade, 20 years ago, we would go to a frame builder and get everything tailor-made. Now with mass-produced carbon bikes, you don't have that same tailoring, but it's starting to come back in. It is, and especially with the bike fit itself. Now, the only thing that you can't really get that you could with the old bikes was the handling, the actual handling and feel of a bike. But you can at least get the perfect position. And it's the key thing. Does it matter whether you spend 4,000 really or 8,000 in my view? The bike fits, it's going to work. If it doesn't fit, it's not going to work. I've ridden $10,000 bikes that doesn't have the right fit and it just it feels off. And you, know, you get a $3,000 bike and it's so important for first timers especially to do it. When you get more experienced, I think that you start figuring out your position, you know what feels right. But when you don't know what feels right, you have to have a bike fit. Yeah, and watch for Mark O'Brien at the National Championships. I'm tipping a top 10 finish and he will be in the right position, at least on his bike. Next up, we're talking boot camp on bikes with Chloe McComble. Cycling Australia has recently run its third boot camp where military meets cycling. They've given away four scholarships and one of them was with us, Chloe McConville. Chloe, welcome back to Civilisation. Yeah, thanks, Matt. <laughs> Interesting concept, Scott. Military camp for cycling, why? Well, the original concept, and you can correct me on this if I'm incorrect at all, Chloe, is that they'd spend a lot of time, a lot of energy on and money developing female cyclists in Australia. They'd be very good with their physiology, then they would go well inside the National Road Series level races here in Australia, take them to Europe completely out of their depth. There'd be a meltdown, they'd send them home, and it was a waste of time. So they wanted to try and So why not do it with the men, because that happens to the men as well? It does, but perhaps not at the same sort of numbers, and maybe they've got so many more men that mm. they're quite happy to have my have wife has given that. birth she assures me that women are tougher than men anyway yeah true <laughs> true well is that still the concept the understanding of why they do it it's more about the character building and testing of character than the actual physiology yeah i think i mean i think a lot of it as well was getting rid of that kind of bitchy environment that was in women's cycling i know there was you know you hear of stories Shock -holler. <laughs> hear of stories along the lines but um yeah definitely spending 10 days getting kind of you know beaten mentally, physically kind of thing. Um, yeah, you definitely feel like by the end of it, you're closer to those people you've gone through with and you've all gone through it together. So you're definitely a team at the end. And I suppose people who can't mould into that environment, can't be adaptable, definitely won't make it over in Europe. So Vianney Reese was famous for his boot camps and they dipped them in the ice water just about. What was the strangest thing you guys did? Uh, one of the coolest things we did was build a bike from scratch. So we had to lace our own wheels. Um, so one bike between the four of us. It took us nearly eight hours. Really? Um, you know, do know that Evan Basso can't even change a puncture, so why bother? <laughs> yeah, it was it was pretty awesome. Like, it gave us a massive appreciation for how great a job the mechanics do, and when they build, you know, multiple. Did you bikes, ride the you know. bike that you built? Yeah, I was actually the candidate who rode the bike, and it was pretty. Was so you got little... points for bravery. Yeah, well, I, I was. Um, it was a, a 57 frame, so I was the tallest girl left. Yeah. So. I just kind of put my hand up and said, yeah, I'll take this one for the team. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a massive sense of achievement when we finished it. Like mm. it was, yeah, it was awesome. That was, that was a great kind of part of the camp for us. A lot us. of pro bike, bike riders who can't do that. Nah, did, did these test real world situations as athletes or 
or, or did it seem quite random? What is some of the stuff you did as you could see yourself doing possibly in Europe? Um, we did heaps of long car trip or long bus trips. So from the last two seasons I've spent away racing in Europe, I mean, there's been days you spend up to kind of 10 hours in the back of a car and you just got to deal with it. There's no point getting upset or whinging about it. It's just one of those things you just got to suck it up and get through. So we did a lot of those. So that was really relevant to, to stuff we, that happens in Europe. Um, and then also we did this 200k ride, which we had no idea of how far we were going. Um, we had no idea of the terrain that we were going to be facing. And it ended up, we went from Barlow to Threadbow, which included four and a half thousand metres of vertical gain. Um, and took us eight hours. And along the way we had individual time trials. And so the last time trial was 35k's individual time trial to the top. Um, and I suppose the feelings of kind of hopelessness, you couldn't see anyone, you couldn't see the lead, like the follow vehicles, they held them back and it started snowing at the top and it was just one of those kind of, am I ever going to get to the finish? Did anyone have gonna... a meltdown? Oh, one girl got carted off with hypothermia, which was unintentional, but yeah. um, I think on the coach's behalf, they were a bit worried about, about what happened and, and obviously safety concerns there. But I'm sensing an opportunity here for a reality TV show, Survivor, Big Brother, or whatever it may be. Who got voted off the island first? Um, well, How's that work? Well, I think they, the first three days is just pure physiological testing. So if people didn't kind of grade high enough in those, um, they were kind of the first ones cold. And actually in the last camp, I was the very first person off the camp. So the flame was out. Yeah, I got well and truly cut. So um, yeah, it was nice to go back this time and get all the way through for sure. What was the process for that though? It wasn't, you know, you didn't get to shake hands and say thank you very much and go home. You, it was directly cut and gone, wasn't it? Yeah, so basically the whole time you're known just as a number. So I was number five on camp. Um, I don't think numbers I bet any relevance to anything. You were just literally a number and um, basically you're all sitting in a room, your, your bags have been packed the night before, your bikes have been packed up, um, you all go into a room and they just call out a bunch of numbers. Um, those numbers go and they're, they're the ones staying and the, the rest of the numbers are the you ones who get cold and we, you, yeah, you just don't see them. So. And you learn how to change the wheel on a bus, which is good news as well. If you get a job at Orica Green Edge, <laughs> that could come in handy. Good luck with the year ahead, you're back to Europe. Yeah, yeah, really excited to be going over again. Got a few, um, few like little boxes I want to keep on ticking off. So yeah, it should be really exciting to head back over there again. Keep an eye on Chloe McComble. She survived the boot camp. She can change a wheel on a bus and build her own bike. Plenty of pro bike riders can't do that. Up next, it's the healthy living tips, courtesy of health.com.au. Well, the word supplements has been on the, a hot topic, especially in Australia with everything that happened in the uh, football codes in the last couple of years. What supplements, Alan, do you recommend that cyclists or sports people should be able to take? Um, and which ones are safe? Uh, I guess the first thing I'd talk about is the definition of exactly what you call a supplement because I think different people have different definitions of it. So uh, I guess I'd look at sort of three categories of supplements. First is it being your sports foods, so that's everything from your sports drinks, your bars, your gels, those sorts of things. So generally, you know, they're pretty safe and they're, you know, most people will potentially get some benefit from them. But again, you know, how much you need and depends on what sort of training or racing that you're doing and, and what the requirement is. The, the next group is your vitamin and mineral type supplements, which are necessary in some cases for people that have a specific deficiency. So if someone has low iron, for example, take an iron supplement will obviously help correct that. Um, calcium and, and so on. And then the third group is what we call the ergogenic aids, which are supplements that are specifically taken for a performance benefit. So that's things like caffeine, like your beetroot juice, your nitrate, um, beta alanine, bicarb, these sorts of supplements. In terms of athletes, um, in cycling in particular, there's a huge amount of supplements on the market. And so it's hard to sift through exactly what is beneficial and what's not. Um, but in terms of the ones that may be of beneficial of benefit to cyclists. The first one would be caffeine. Um, that, that's one that we know is uh, quite beneficial for endurance performance, but the response is quite variable. So some people get a large benefit from caffeine, some people get a very modest benefit, and some people actually get, do worse with caffeine. So I think the, the lesson from that with any supplement is to make sure you try it out beforehand in some way that you can actually measure what effect it's having on you, rather than just turning up to a race and trying something for the first time. The other ones I would say would be nitrate, the beetroot juice. There's some promising research there around endurance performance. But again, there seems to be responders and non-responders. And the research is suggesting probably that the most elite athletes are the, probably the people who will get the least benefit from that type of supplement. Who or which type of rider would you recommend actually go to a, a doctor 
and get the blood testing done. I'm imagining an elite rider would need that kind of uh, service. Yeah, generally a lot of the uh, elite level riders or the NRS sort of level riders that I work with, we would often recommend that they get blood tests done periodically, particularly if you know fatigue is a major factor for them and they're finding that they're really struggling to back up and recover from you know one one event to the next. Uh, for other people, I guess if you uh, you know you have a history of iron deficiency. Um, or you're just feeling really lethargic and you, you don't have other reasons for that um, because it could be anything, you know, sleep deprivation or all sorts of things. Um, but, you know, you can always talk to your GP about it and they can, can organise a test for you. Well, you must be going through a little bit of that yourself at the moment. You've got a young baby at home, so a little <laughs> bit of sleep, sleep deprivation. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Ten weeks and, uh, yeah, I think I haven't got more than about five hours sleep in that ten weeks. I'm sure Wade's a few weeks behind me. So from Alan McCubbin and the Next Level Nutrition with the healthy living tips courtesy of health.com.au, we're going to put on some weight perhaps with Chris Kavanagh from My Kitchen Rules out on the hot lap. It was his cousin Smiley Sam last week. There was a smidgen over a minute and 29 seconds. Can Chris of Panache Desserts get the better of him? On My Kitchen Rules, thanks to editing, there was a lot of confrontation and we've had Smiley Sam last week and it's cousin Chris this week. Chris, we've seen Sam set the benchmark. It's 129.1. Can yep. you beat him? I, uh, I'd like to think so, yeah. Yeah, should have him covered today. You did the Melbourne Marathon, not the Melbourne Marathon, the Ironman yep. early this year, so this is just a warm-up. It is, yeah. Well, I'd, I'd probably do. I'm hoping for about a 118, is it, Scotty? 118 one, <laughs> it's arguing 118.0. Oh. Big should be only four. Talking it up. Yeah. Yeah. You've, you've got more experience on the bike. How long have you been riding? Uh, probably about five years now, so... Mm. Got a few Ks in the legs, but a few more to catch up, Scotty. And, <laughs> and yeah. you know what? I'm a bit peckish, though. Yeah. I know you're about to start the race. We probably should have got some catering organised. We should have, because you're, do you're doing your own catering now. Yeah, uh, panache desserts. So a lot of uh, desserts based from home and selling to cafes and doing quite a few events. So uh, get on board. Yeah, we should have got on board a little bit earlier. <laughs> you're going to need plenty of panache to get the better of Smiley Sam. Yeah. All right. Cousins, this is family bragging rights. Blood is thicker than water. <laughs> this is where it really matters. Yeah. You ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready. Let's go. Before we give you the final countdown, something to think about when you're on your way. Yep. The rumours of the relationship with both Jack and Sophia on My Kitchen Rules. Uh, think of a response for when you get back. <laughs> I will. I okay. Will. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Sophia. <laughs> oh, that was the fastest click in. I've that was a good season. click in. Yep. I thought, not... I, I thought I might have heard just a, as he was laying it over, accelerating, a little bit of brake rub. Ooh, how many seconds are in that? Psychologically, five. <laughs> <laughs> if he, and if he loses to Sam, I don't think they're worried about any other times, Sam and Chris. They're just worried about Sam and Chris. Yeah. And you've actually, I think you've ridden a little bit with Chris, haven't you? Chris, we did the Emu's Grand Fondo. Uh, I met him actually last year's Emu's Grand Fondo, and then we stayed together this year, and he actually cooked for, uh, out of the mystery box for us. It was did really he? good. Yeah. It would have been nice. Yeah, it was. Look, he does do a lot of riding. The Melbourne... Uh, Melbourne Iron Man, but that's such a different beast, isn't it? It's a completely, completely different, different animal to yeah. this. Here he comes, and the pink is flying. That's 118. So it once is. again, McGrory can relax. He's looking for 129.1, and there was a little bit of brake rattle at the start. It is going to be close. Oh, desperately close. He's right in the ballpark. Ooh, wow. So, did you think about Sophia when you were out on the lap? Yeah, I did a bit. She, uh... she came into your mind. Got yeah, you she... angry. Got me through the tough times. <laughs> got you through the tough times. <laughs> <laughs> tough times lasted around a random minute or so. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we saw your cousin last week. He did 129.1. You've done 129.6. Oh, he's got me. <laughs> he's got you by a half a second. How do you that, feel? That headwind picked up enormously. It, it, it strengthened? Yeah. Unbelievable. So, as a result, the punishment is you have to do catering for the bike lane for the rest of the season. Sure. That can work? Yeah, I think so. PanacheDesserts.com.au? Yeah, Sam will foot the bill. Sam will foot the bill. <laughs> yeah. well, it's only uh, another 50 week, 51 weeks for the season, so <laughs> it should be fine. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, yeah. Sounds good. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, it was great fun. Good. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it. Well done. Cheers, Chris. Uh, so between the cousins, my kitchen rules, it's Sam who wins, but it's PanacheDesserts.com.au who'll be doing the catering for the rest of the season. Chris Kavanagh beaten by the cousin Smiley Sam. Panache desserts, maybe he's had a little bit too much. I think the problem was cornering. 
Well, I thought that uh, he seemed more confident before the, before the ride. So I thought that he was going to get his cars, but yeah, not good enough. Had the motor, but Sam put the brakes away on that bottom He's corner. He's done Ironman before. You know, if there were 30 laps, he would have been, he would have been up there. Yeah, it's yeah. only one lap, mate. The race is yeah. what it is. All right, November, we're doing our thing for Movember. And Wade tried to go early with the razor. He thought once we film this, he'd be able to sneak it off. Oh. But not the case. <laughs> but looking after another charity as well. Yeah, there's the uh, 6 and 100. It's the six Australians who have worn the yellow jersey in the past 100 years. Um, the, uh, a friend of mine is actually raising money for ovarian cancer. So 100% of the proceeds goes towards uh, the Cancer Council. And you can uh, buy a raffle ticket or you can uh, bid in the auction online, 6and100.org. And keep the money coming for Movember. We're raising plenty of funds. I'm impressed with the amount of money your website is raising. It's great. Thanks to Country Road for making us look respectable. Thanks to Northside Wheelers, Shifter Bikes as well for hosting a few of our interviews. And thanks to you for all your feedback. We were small on what's on your mind this week. We'll go bigger on it next week. So keep the feedback coming. Till then, bye for now.